Hi, everybody. Welcome back. This is John Malanka with the United Patients Group. Be informed and be well. Today's special guest is a dear friend. Uh, not only is she a cannabis nurse, she's a cannabis mom, but she was one of our head nurses at United Patients Group for years and had gone on, I want to say, gone on to bigger and better things because we still want you back. <laughs> um, but she's a co-founder of Cannabis Nurses Network and uh, I'd like to introduce you to my dear friend, Jana Champagne. So welcome, Jana. Thank you, John. I'm so excited to be here. This is wonderful. Good to have you on. We've always talked uh, via, via phone and talking about patients and what we're doing mm -hmm. and stuff like that. So to have you on, I think is great. Um, let's talk about autism. I know, let, well, let's go into, if you can talk about your little, maybe a little about your background and why autism really stands up. I know you work with cannabis patients. We've sent you hundreds and hundreds of patients. Thousands. Yeah, thousands <laughs> of patients. Thank you for that. Um, yes. Everything from sleep issues, anxiety, to cancer, um, and, every, and everything in between. And so, but in there falls the autism and why that's near and dear to your heart and why uh, you have not only been a cannabis expert uh, in other ailments, but also really a cannabis expert with autism. So uh, can you share, you know, your background? Uh, and cannabis wasn't always your lifestyle as well. So, I mean, I think a lot of us have fallen into this, into this sector where cannabis uh, has not, but it is now. Or, you know, Corinne and I always say we're, we've been adopted and, you know, we've been recruited uh, to, to, to help others. And so um, go for it, Jana. Yeah, well, thank you, John. I appreciate that. And, um, and so I, I'm a registered nurse in the state of Oregon and I was working in a hospital full time, working on my graduate degree, homeschooling my kid with autism, ignoring all my red signals that something was wrong in my body and I was out of balance. And I suffered a major health collapse in 2012. And this is what brought me initially to cannabis. As a mainstream nurse, I had never considered it. You know, I'm in Oregon. We had patients that would come through with it and, you know, never really took it seriously as medicine at all um, until I started seeking options for myself after almost two years of mainstream treatment. I was still disabled, not able to work, non-functional a lot of the times, um, and turned to cannabis for pain relief. I had a lot, I had lupus was one of my diagnoses. So I had a lot of joint pains and different issues going on around that. Knew I didn't want to go down the opioid death pathway that, you know, as a nurse, you see how that ends for patients. And it's, you know, there's a lot of motivation to avoid it when you really see what it does to people's health. And uh, so I turned to cannabis just for pain. And the cannabis not only alleviated my pain, it lifted my brain fog and, and renewed my cognitive function, which it got so bad at one point that I quit my master's degree program, eight credits shy of my degree. After eight years straight of school, I quit eight credits shy. Would have been one more quarter. Um, I couldn't write a paper anymore. And it brought back my brain. It brought back my immune function has improved significantly. In fact, my autoimmune lupus is now seroconverted. So I'm negative for lupus now, which is unheard of with the mainstream approach. So it did so many wonderful things for my own health. And then a couple of years later, my daughter with autism entered puberty crisis, which is, it's synonymous to about 50% of kids with autism. So it's very common. Um, and she went from being this sweet, cuddly, eager to please little girl to the puberty monster where she was self-injurious. She would punch herself in the head. She had knocked holes in every wall of my house. She had punched holes through the door. She was beating up every caregiver and parent and ever, every authority figure in her life. So this brought her about a lot of safety issues. And at one point, she, she just nearly missed being placed out of home for safety issues. So when we brought cannabis on board and we started with non-intoxicating THCA, uh, you know, so I could take some time to research, you know, the, the considerations in children and adolescents using THC, but it eased her puberty crisis and it spared her out of home placement. And it brought us back to a place, it, it brought us back from that edge that we were teetering with crisis in our family. And it calmed everything down. It's, it's never perfect, but it made it manageable for her. And so, you know, seeing this response, of course, I began sharing my story. And there's so many other autism families that have discovered cannabis as a safe and effective remedy for their child. And, you know, deep diving into the research, I came to the conclusion that autism is endocannabinoid deficiency and the deficiency in cannabinoids that we used to have in our diet every day. We, you know, before 1937, we were feeding it to our animals. We were eating it ourselves. It's, and the cannabinoids are vital nutrients that keep our bodies in balance. 
And in autism, there's three major areas that are out of balance and cannabis helps to promote balance in all three of those. It's the gut, the brain, and the immune system. So it goes beyond just that superficial symptom management where it's easing the situations. It's actually promoting healing in some of these underlying issues in autism. So it's a really, it's been a huge hitter for us and so many families that I've worked with. You know, isn't it amazing on how much we learn about this plant? Because like you, you know, Corinne and I, as I mentioned earlier, we were, we were just recruited into this industry. And mm -hmm. Corinne was anti-cannabis for years, you know, mm -hmm. and then we started researching what was gone. And of course, her father, who's still with us today, she said, gosh, I cannot believe this is not a medicine. Mm -hmm. It's a medicine in 1937. And you go deeper into it and people always ask, they call us up, you know, does it work for this? Does it work for that? Does it work for this? Does it work for that? And I always laugh because even the, at, at, when I present at not only cannabis conferences, but cancer conferences, I put a roll of duct tape on one of my presentations and they look at like, did, they, did you want that, uh, that slide? Is that slide supposed to be there? And there's a roll of duct tape. And I said, this slide is specifically for the questions. Does, I don't want to say cannabis has a million one uses like duct tape. If we get down to the nitty gritty, it really does. I mean, there are 120 cannabinoids plus and minus. I say plus and minus because some say 150, some say 113. And the cannabinoids, you know, each has a role. A, a major cannabinoid, of course, THC, uh, CBD, which is in <laughs> every store, grocery store, gas station. I mean, you're hearing about everywhere you go. And you get to the, the acid form, which, which you mentioned that you did for your daughter, which is THCA, the non-psychoactive uh, cannabinoid. It's like uh, juicing wheatgrass. And I think everyone should be on this. It's almost a, like a daily nutrient, like a vitamin as well, uh, keeping, keeping the body back to homeostasis, but it's great for inflammation. And so do you still, um, I know it's not a one size fits all, but do you still um, recommend or work with patients that are, that are uh, uh, maybe their child or the loved one is going through autism as well? Do you, always, do you still go right back to the THCA um, cannabinoid or are you uh, kind of mixing and matching? I know again, as I mentioned, it's not a one-size-fits-all. There really is no one-size-fits-all with autism. Um, and most other diseases as well fall on a spectrum where you have the more severe, you have the less severe, and everything in between. Um, you know, the nice thing about cannabis is, like you mentioned, John, it's a vital nutrient. Our bodies require cannabinoids. And, and what a lot of people don't understand is that internally, we make endocannabinoids. We have an endocannabinoid system that produces them. The most prolific source of endocannabinoids that we make is breast milk, which really lends to that, oh, these are vital nutrients, they're in breast milk. Um, but really what it does is, is when these cannabinoids either that we make internally or the ones from the plant, if we can't make them internally or have you know, some deficiency that way, the plant, the molecules in the plant act exactly like the ones we make. There's uh, an endocannabinoid called anandamide and it's synonymous with THC. There's one called 2-AG, it's synonymous with CBD and so on. And as you mentioned, we have hundreds of cannabinoids. I think the last number I heard was up in the 160s, but we're learning, we're finding new ones every day. So we're very much in our infancy as far as our, our breadth of knowledge around this plant and what we know for sure. But we do know that it's a vital nutrient. We know that it promotes health. We know that it promotes balance. And when you consider in a general view, you know, I, I do hear a lot of skepticism, like how could one thing be good for so many different disorders, but underlying in any health disorder, any health uh, diagnosis is imbalances that are causing the symptoms and causing the disease. So when you consider that cannabis very intelligently promotes balance throughout the body, that really explains how it can be so high impact for so many different things. You know, you're, you're everything else. I take an individualized approach. Well, I know you're, you're such a great, great educator. And, and, you know, over the years, like you said, thousands of patients, you know, and it just Jana, 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 Jana. And it's been mm -hmm. great. Can you share, because you are such a great educator, because I would get, you know, I'd always get the feedbacks, receive the feedbacks from our, the patients that we'd send to you and just taking, you know, giving them hope. And I never want to give anybody false hope. And when you go through something as severe as autism or see your child mm -hmm. go through this uh, or your spouse or your, whoever yourself going through, uh, uh, you know, a, a, an ailment, a disease in the body, you know, mm -hmm. your, your whole world comes rocking down on you. And so maybe a lot of, I should say, maybe a lot of our followers right now are probably parents like you who are researching on, you know, internet, trying to find information, their loved one has autism and, and find 
can you share, you being such a great educator, putting you on the spot, but can you share um, uh, what the endocannabinoid system is? Uh, every mammal, every animal has a vertebrae, does it have a vertebrae? Yes, yes. And, it, and that's a little sketchy, so I'll try to get through this. Um, the endocannabinoid system is the 12th system in our body. Um, it was discovered in 1992 by, by a researcher named Raphael Meshulam, and he found this receptor that interacts with THC and cannabis. That's initially how he found it. But as we continued to learn about the endocannabinoid system, we learned that it acts like the endocrine system. So there's receptors throughout our body and every other system of our body. And when cannabinoids, whether internally produced or sourced from the plant, interact with our endocannabinoid system, it promotes homeostasis or balance in our body. So that's kind of the big picture view. Um, the research supports that life would not be possible without an endocannabinoid system. So it truly is vital. These nutrients are vital. And if you look historically, you know, when we took cannabis off of the market in 1937, they taxed it so highly that nobody could afford it anymore. It was no longer being fed to our animals. It wasn't in our eggs and our meat and our milk. We weren't consuming it ourselves as medicine or as food. And we, we, we triggered this, this historical flip in our, the health of our society. And all of a sudden chronic illness became rampant. And I think, you know, this, this, term endocannabinoid deficiency was coined by Dr. Ethan Russo in 2004, and he links it with every single chronic illness that's known to man, that the endocannabinoid system deficiency is a cause of every chronic illness, basically. So it's huge impact for so many people. You know, and, and you know, I always say, you know, endocannabinoid system, and in, in, in layman term, it's like, what does it crave? It craves cannabinoids, bringing the body back to balance, back to back to uh, you know homeostasis. And I, sorry, I don't. It's funny. My was my speaker earlier going going in and out because a thing popped up and said your speaker, and I hadn't touched anything. And, and so anyway, we're glad we're back on here. Yeah, I uh, thought it was my internet. So I'm oh no, no, I'll, I'll take, I'll take <laughs> okay. full, full, full blame on that. Um, let's talk about you know. Um, let's talk about the, the cannabinoids that you that you generally use in treating not only your daughter, but other patients that come to you. Um, because a lot of them don't have access to THCA or THC. THC, you know, a lot of patients say, help, I want the, I don't want the recreational part of the plant, I want the medical part of the plant. And so can you talk that all the cannabinoids, the importance of, of all cannabinoids, uh, how they all play a role uh, in, in bringing the body back to homeostasis and healing uh, and the entourage effect as well. Yes, absolutely. And so, you know, THC, of course, is intoxicating. It has this stigma that it's just a recreational drug. But realistically, it has really bona fide medical uses. And one of them is for autoimmune. I credit THC for reversing my autoimmune markers because research supports that it actually reduces the T cell activity of the immune system which is what triggers that self-attack or that, you know, that hyper-reactivity of the immune system. So your body starts attacking your own tissue. That is the definition of autoimmune. So, it, you know, in another great use I can think of is PTSD. It can act as an amnesiac. It can help people forget the trauma. It can help them heal from that. Um, Parkinson's disease is another one. We know THC increases dopamine, so it can replace some of the Parkinson's medications you know, when done correctly with physician oversight, of course, on that piece. Um, so it does have bona fide medical uses, as do all the other cannabinoids. And for those who are lacking access to THC, I mean, luckily we have several cannabinoid components that are available under the current hemp law, which allows hemp in all 50 states. We have CBD, CBG, CBGA, CBDA, CBN is a newer one on the market. So we do have a lot of options to potentially help people, even if they can't access the THC or prefer to stay with the non-intoxicating compounds. And so for our followers that are coming, like, again, doing the research on here, can you please mm -hmm. let them, you know, uh, still to this day, a lot of the, the calls that we receive, I think the only way to ingest cannabis is via smoking. And so the stigma oh, of smoking is there. And so can you talk <laughs> about, like, how am I supposed to get my daughter, you know, she's four, and she has, she's autistic, you know, and I can't, she can't smoke. And 
So you have to go back and then do you, do you receive those type of questions as well? Oh, all the time, all the time. And, you know, and I find that once you educate people and they, they realize that there is such a thing as targeted medical use where you're individualizing a protocol, you're, you're relying on what the research supports for their specific situation or condition. You know, it's a very different approach. I don't ever have a patient call me and pay for a consultation so that they can get higher or more intoxicated. That just doesn't happen. There is serious medical use. And then I, you know, I counter that even those that are inhaling or using adult use or recreational are still receiving medical benefits. And there was a retrospective study done um, on cannabis smokers that have been using cannabis through inhalants only for 20 years. And they had like an 80% less instance of diabetes. So it, even if somebody is just using it recreationally, they're still kind of self-medicating and they're still receiving some benefit from that. But for really targeted, serious medical use, I, don't, I very rarely recommend inhalants. It's usually tinctures, sublingual tinctures or um, concentrates or topicals, something of that nature where it's, you know, the focus is not the intoxicating effect. Um, although inhalants can be very useful, and, and I have taught my daughter to use a vape pen, we only use it for emergency rescue. So there, there are days still when she struggles with, you know, severe PMS and migraines, and, and you can see her ramping up in some behaviors, the vape pen will stop it in its tracks. And, you know, we've taught it to her as her straw, and there are days that she will, she's you know, really fighting to maintain, maintain control, and she'll say, straw, and we run for it, because it's just so quick. You know, sublinguals are 10 to 15 minutes, which if your child is struggling to main, maintain control, that can feel like a really long time. It, Not it, everybody, but it is a tool. And it's amazing on the night and day, to the, uh, uh, a friend of mine, her daughter has autism, mm -hmm. and you can really tell when it clicks in, and it's like, yes. oh. so what are we doing today? type of thing before it was, you know, like you said with your daughter and you shared a lot of your stories with the holes in the walls and stuff like that. Um, yes. Just talk, talk about um, uh, minors and cannabis. Minors, you know, uh, this topic, you know, this topic comes up. I don't want to give my minor or how do I have this conversation with my doctor? And can you share what you share with other parents that are going through this in a legal state or illegal state? I always share it's not legal to have this conversation. Sharing more is my my speaker out again. I think it I think it's back. It's funny, it, it, I've it's never like ever. Here, so let, well, t let me know. Let me know if it goes uh, goes south. But can you talk about how does a parent talk about this with their child's doctor? See, now that's that's the tricky part. Um, most. Physicians did not learn about the endocannabinoid system or the science behind it in medical school. They're still not teaching it in medical schools. They're not teaching it in nursing schools. So it, you know, it, it takes finding a medical professional that is open to cannabis or um, already knows the benefits of cannabis therapy and is actively advocating. So one thing that parents can, can, can do if, if they're in a legal state and they have a medical program is get their child a medical card. And that protects them legally from any possible ramifications if somebody wants to cause them a headache and finds out they're giving their child cannabis that will protect them um, and so that's a very important piece and and you know there are many physicians that and most many states that offer cannabis legal access to medical cannabis for autism specifically and there is an organization named mama it's uh, mothers advocating for medical marijuana for autism and they are really pushing to, to make autism a qualifying condition in legal cannabis state. So that's a great organization to connect with. If you don't have it in your state, you're wondering what you can do. Uh, when it comes to actually treating the autism, you know, the protocols, even with, with you know, uh, a professional like myself advising, the, the very first recommendations may not be the best fit. It, it, it's expected that it's going to require some experimentation just because every kid with autism is so different. Um, I do have an autism cannabis patient handbook that I'm offering for free download and it, it gives some tidbits about THCA might be good for these symptoms, you know, CBD might be good for these symptoms and, and what to consider as far as pharmaceuticals and things like that. 
So that's always an option as well. And I'll give John the, the link for that. It's integratedholisticcare.com forward slash subscribe. And you put in your email and it takes you right to the download. So that's always an option. Um, and we have nurses who are trained to work with kids with autism as well. So if you want more of the individualized approach or you're worried about interactions with your child's pharmaceuticals, things like that, we can do a more intensive consultation as well. Can you hear me right now or no? Yes. Okay, because the, the thing still says your speaker's not working. Please check your connection. Oh, or use a different odd. It's, it's me, my end, or not, not yours. Um, and I've never seen this, and I've done hundreds and hundreds of these. Um, Thank you God know, for editing, right? <laughs> I know. Well, no, I think we'll just let it go. I think it's great. We'll just do this podcast. We're happy to do it this way. Um, you, oh, mentioned, you mentioned uh, pharmaceuticals. I'm glad you said that because, mm -hmm. you know, it's very important to look at what's uh, it, cannabis is not a one size fits all. Age, look at the age of the patient, weight of the patient, current health condition, and medications that they, he or she may be on. And so, can you talk about uh, making sure about uh, combining cannabis with, with pharmaceuticals? Uh, titrating off should be with a medical professional, uh, just don't do it cold turkey. And mm -hmm. uh, if we start with that, and then I want to talk to, talk to you about dosing afterwards. Sure, of course. And so, you know, pharmaceuticals and concurrent use of cannabis is, is a major consideration. It should be overseen by a medical professional that understands how they might interact and how you might need to adjust your pharmaceuticals once you start cannabis. Um, as a nurse, I don't take care of that part. It has to be done by the prescribing physician or another physician because I can't counter a physician's order which a prescription is. Unless it's a PRN or as needed, then I can help it. Um, so that's, that's one limitation of a nurse being involved in that piece. Um, there are many other individual considerations of cannabis therapy as well. And because of this, my nurses and I put together a patient self questionnaire. And it actually details reasons why you might want to seek medical oversight before starting your cannabis therapy. Of course, pharmaceutical medications is one of those. You know, cancer is another, diabetes, hypertension use in child or adolescence. And that kind of comes back to what you asked before about the considerations there. Um, with THC, there is one research study that supports that there could be neurodevelopmental risk factors with THC use in childhood or adolescence. So once again, it's, it's making sure that a medical professional is assessing the situation. Um, you know, I've gotten to where I can look genetically to see if a child is predisposed to those risk factors and help to mitigate them through nutrigenomics, which is a whole other subject. But there are things you can do to help improve that risk factor is the point. Um, and, and really, it's about weighing the risk versus benefit. Most kids that are using THC have got something more serious like cancer, or they have autism, so they already have neurodevelopmental issues, and they're beating themselves up every day. And if THC decreases that, that risk of harm, which is much more profound than the potential harm from cannabis, then that turns out to potentially be an option. Um, you know, that said, I always follow the parents' lead. You know, as a special needs mom myself, I feel like the parents' instinct is a powerful tool to help guide and make sure that we're reaching success of their goals for their child with autism around the cannabis. And, and that's really important, too, is to set up reasonable goals and make sure they understand it may take some experimentation. It may not be perfect. You know, it, it may, may need that we need to come back and try some different products or try different dosing. Um, or tweak some other things in order to really see optimal results. And my daughter's protocol changes depending on how she looks any given day. We have a protocol for pain, we have a protocol for PMS, we have a protocol for, you know, just regular teenage moodiness. Life, life, yeah. Um, which so brings, it's flexible. Yeah, it's which great. brings me to the next question is, um, since it's not a one size fits all and you say you have this arsenal, okay, how is she mm -hmm. feeling today and what are we putting in there? Um, uh, can you get, kind of give an idea of uh, dosing protocol? Is it five milligrams or is it 150 milligrams? Oh. Where are we looking at? Or is it, again, it's, I know it's different for everyone. And also, um, staying ahead, like in a pain patient, you know, on a scale of one to 10, they're at a 10, but when they take cannabis or the opioids, you know, they're down to a two. Mm -hmm. Don't wait until you're at a 10 again before you take it. And so a lot of doctors will say, hey, you know, uh, before you uh, get to that pain threshold, let's stay ahead of the pain. And the same thing uh, with, with I'm seeing with autistic children is 
keeping it in the system, not so they're drugged out all day, but keeping it and knowing, like you said, you know your daughter, a mother or father knows, should know their child and what they're going through and saying, oh, we're seeing this reaction or we're seeing how their personality is changing here. I can see this is about to come on, you know, every day at two o'clock, I'm, I'm running nice. the same thing. And so mm -hmm. do you recommend or do you do this with your daughter where you stay ahead of before the breakdown happens? Absolutely, absolutely. And, and I teach that once you figure out what works for your child and works for, you know, what triggers those huge behaviors in them, then you can act preventatively. And as soon as you start seeing signs that there's disease or that they're, that they're discontent and they're starting to show signs of agitation, you can treat early on and often prevent that huge exacerbation. And, you know, just to give you a little bit of perspective on that, at, at height of my daughter's puberty crisis, she was melting down and tantruming full tilt tantrum, she would go for two or three hours and she would literally exhaust herself physically and pass out at the end. So, I mean, this is what we're trying to prevent. Nowadays, if she gets upset, usually we can prevent the meltdown completely. Um, usually, you know, we can have her feeling better in maximum of 10 or 15 minutes if we go with sublingual. She's learning to self-soothe, she's learning to self-comfort. She'll actually give herself a time out in her room when she's not handling things well. So it, it gives our kids, because our kids don't feel good about their behaviors either. A lot of times they show remorse after the fact and they feel badly. So we're giving them really important tools to self-manage at the same time that we're medicating and help, helping to, to target some of the underlying causes of their behaviors. So it's, it's such a wonderful tool that way. What, what, what's your daughter's age now? Uh, she just turned 18 a couple of weeks ago. Already. Oh my gosh. You know, I, I think yes. I, did know, I did know that. Um, so what happens for a family uh, that's watching this right now and their child goes to school and they have, are they, should they be about the day or do they take it before school and then after school? And so I know some parents, because mm -hmm. it's probably not legal on the majority of schoolyards, a lot of parents will take their child, pick their child up throughout the day, drive down the street, administer mm -hmm. the, the, the dose, and then drop the, the child back off at school. What can you share with uh, families that are going through that or sh have to go through that? Well, you know, as far as just starting out, don't ever, ever, ever start your child on cannabis for the very first time on a school morning and send them off to school. Please, please don't do that. <laughs> please start on a day when it's a weekend, you don't have any plans, you can kind of assess their response. As far as dosing, you know, the dosing ranges for my clients with autism are everything from two milligrams a day to 200 milligrams a day, literally, and half a dozen different compounds, THC, THCA, CBD, CBG, CBN. I mean, it, this is, you have so many tools, so you really need to experiment and figure out your child's sweet spot. Once you've done that, it's perfectly safe to dose them and send them to school once you know what to, what to, to expect from that. In legal states, always highly encourage having that card because if someone at school picks it up and you're in an IEP fight like so many of us are over trying to optimize our kids' education, I've seen that used against parents before. And, uh, and so you just want to make sure you have your ducks in a row, make sure you know your ramifications if you're not in a legal state and you're using cannabis. You can make an informed decision about how to proceed on that. Uh, but, but do know it's very flexible. Um, you know, it, my daughter, she's on a regimen where she's taking a capsule of tincture twice a day. Morning is CBD, CBG, THCA, and a little bit of THC. And the nighttime is THC, CBN, and THCA. And then in between, we do sublinguals, we do vaping, whatever this situation might call for. So you can get to a point where you're dosing a couple times a day, you have pretty good symptom management, but you have a harder day for whatever reasons, like our kids do, they're consistently inconsistent never quite know what you're going to get. It's like that box of chocolates. Yeah. Um, you know, it's flexible. You can use it as needed very safely. So are there any terpenes that you're finding that you're finding uh, beneficial for your daughter or other, other uh, children going through autism? Yes. With autism, I tend to stick with the indica terpenes, meaning uh, linalol, myrcene, humulene, uh, beta carophylline is showing a lot of promise. And so we want more of that calming effect. The, 
the exception to that would be a child with ADD or ADHD, which is considered to be kind of high functioning autism now. Um, and those kids, especially if, if they respond therapeutic to stimulants like Adderall or Ritalin, oftentimes sativa will be calming for them. It's kind of the opposite. Um, but other, you know, my go-to if I don't know their response to stimulants is still to start with the Indicas because those tend to be the more calming strains for autism. I, 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 I heard, well, I, you broke up on that first one, terpene, which is little. Um, Linaloo, which 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 uh, I heard, and I, I knew where you're going uh -huh. with that. So, just for uh, the followers that are watching this for the first time and just doing education for your loved one, I should say, a terpene is uh, what's my dis description is is stop and smell the roses. Mm -hmm. That is a terpene, the scent. You know, stopping and grabbing a lemon or or, or um, a, a lime. You know, limonene, the pine, like the pine needles. Mm -hmm. So they all, you're hearing these companies coming up with essential oils. They've been around forever and they do work. It's great for calming, great for sleep, great for energy. Um, and so a lot of companies uh, will have terpenes in their to leave the terpenes in there, which again are very beneficial as, as well when, when healing um, yourself or, or your child that you're, that you're working with. Um, the topic of pharmaceuticals has come up, you know, quite a bit. Not really in this conversation. I heard you talk about pharmaceuticals and you know, and, and uh, Ritalin, etc. Um, Epidiolex. Um, oh. Kind of have it designed. You, you want to get into the Epidiolex conversation? Sure. If not, no, no uh, worries. No, we, we can do that. that. No, I'm game. Um, uh, Epidiolex is garbage. Don't bother with it. That's the that's the short message. Sorry, you heard you heard it here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <The> long <laughs> So, the rationale uh, is, okay, so it's isolate CBD, um, plus they've added... So, so again, can you share, because probably a lot of followers, like I said, you know, they may not, can't, this is, this is uh, they've no, they know nothing about cannabis. And so right. can you talk about um, um, why, I agree, I agree with you on the isolates, is mm -hmm. that not really the best thing. So you can you share Perfect. what isolates are and uh, yes. talk about different compounds in, in the cannabis plant and making... Uh, medicine, what you're looking for, whole plant, whole plant medicine. Yes, yes, absolutely. And that's one of one of the touch points that I teach to every single patient I talk to is how to find medical quality cannabis. And my nurses and I came up after researching this extensively and seeing so many patients respond differently with different types of products. I began researching this. And, and what I found is that the formulations of cannabis that, that are taking the flower, which constitutes more than 500 therapeutic ingredients. And that's, you know, over 150 cannabinoids, over 200 terpenes or essential oils. We have bioflavonoids, chlorophyll, antioxidants, essential fatty acids. All of that works together with a synergy that we call the entourage effect. And that's going to provide the strongest homeostasis influence on the body, period, is what the research says. There's research supporting um, what we call whole plant or whole spectrum formulations that are concentrating that flower as nature intended with minimal, if any, loss of the compounds uh, versus a CO2 extract, which, you know, CO2 extractions are extremely popular right now and they're very trendy, but the final product of CO2 is usually about a dozen compounds. Isolate is one compound. It's the CBD or the THC or whatever that might be. So it's removing all of those other 500 compounds and you get a very different effect in the body. And what research supports is that the isolate or CO2 uh, exerts a bell curve in the body as far as the response. So as you're increasing the dose, like we teach, you reach a peak, it falls off and literally stops working. So at higher doses where we're guiding patients With cancer and autoimmune and some of the we on the far you side broke of the hundreds of thousands last, of dollars you, getting You're going great. You broke up in the last thing. Can you uh, re rewind about 10 seconds where it says uh, on the, you're hitting on the doses? Yes. So the bell curve response as you're increasing the dose, like we teach patients to do, you peak, fall off, and stop working. So if you're taking really high doses, you could be on the wrong side of that curve and spending hundreds of thousands of dollars and literally getting little to no benefit. And the research is very clear on this. Um, whereas with a whole plant, 
extract or whole spectrum, as you increase the dose, the effect is in very predictable use, not optimal. Those are not the options you want. You want whole plant, which is either food grade ethanol extracted or infused. Uh, butane is a close second, but there aren't a lot of oral formulations of butane. So we, te we tend to not utilize those. Um, the other thing the research supports is that whole plant extracts are just as well or better with fewer side effects at 20 to 25% of the dose of CO2 or isolate. So that represents enormous cost savings for patients. Um, and I wrote a paper on this subject as well. It's a uh, four criteria for ensuring medical quality cannabis. It's on my integrated holistic care website. I can link it to John as well. And it explains all of the rationale, has all of the research citations attached. Do know, to this day, I do not benefit from the sales of any product. So I don't have any profit bias that way. As a patient who happens to be a nurse, I'm, I'm very much pro-patient and follow, following patient needs. You know, with that, and without that profit paradigm, the CO2 and, and isolates just don't make any sense for medical use, which is why I say don't bother with the epidiolics. <laughs> in, in, in a roundabout way, <laughs> you said don't Forgot bother about. with don't, don't buy, uh, bother with epidiolics. Well, um, don't bother with the epidiolics. It's isolate. They put sucralose in there, which can actually trigger seizures. You're going to need, you know, the a year of epidiolics is like, was it $32,000 or something? And you can get a seizure targeted whole plant formulation for about $1,500 a year. So it's more expensive. Big, big, it's really big difference. And <laughs> higher, more side effects, more money. Just don't even bother with it. It's crap. You know, um, as, but what, what do you run into patients that where cannabis is, of course, not covered by insurance, but you, you know, they say they can't afford that, but Mm -hmm. Epidiolics is covered by insurance. Can you can you share that side as a mom, uh, as well as a medical professional, and you're talking to other patients that are going through this? And that yeah, might be the only, that might be their only option, is what I'm getting at. Right, and I haven't run into that situation specifically. I do have patients who who have resorted to isolate because they're in an illegal state and they don't want they're concerned about red flags. They don't want THC in their child system at all. That's one of the benefits of isolate is that all the THC has been removed. So that makes it really optimal for people that might have to drug test for their work, for example, but it's not going to provide that underlying balancing effect that we're after when we're targeting, you know, the more curative potential of cannabis is stripped away with isolates. Yeah. So it could certainly provide some symptom management. You know, we just want to educate so patients understand their options and understand the pros and cons and can make an informed decision. Right. And, that, and that's the thing is education. And that's why we do podcast this. That's why Janet does what she does. I always talk about, it's like getting a pebble and throwing it into a pond and the ripple effects of where this education goes. And so Jan, I thank you for uh, your knowledge and your friendship, but what you're doing and, and, you know, being a mom and hearing your stories um, mm -hmm. over the years, you know, I've shared a lot of, uh, um, your what you your success with friends in my circle uh, and also patients that have come to us who are also know what to do and I'm like you know talk to Jana talk to Jana so can you share with us uh, in closing words do you have any closing words for our audience one but I'd like you also to to uh, uh, share how to how they can get a hold of you as well yes uh, and so I just encourage you if you have any kind of chronic illness Cannabis tends to be the better answer, and you know I'm, I'm integral right now in trying to teach other medical professionals this information. That you know, whenever there's a patient with a need, we should be assessing and, bal and balancing and, and determining the risk versus benefit of all of the options. And when cannabis is included in that assessment, it, it's often the logical first resort for patients, especially with chronic illness, where mainstream medicine doesn't have a lot of good answers. You know. Mainstream medicine is great for acute care. You have a heart attack, by all means, go to the hospital. Don't go to your herbalist. But if it's chronic illness, look at cannabis. Look at it seriously. Look at the research. Um, and, and so if you want to reach out to me, the best place that kind of highlights all of the work I'm doing in this industry by following patient needs is janachampagne.com. Um, if you're an autism parent, one of the things we didn't mention today is that my daughter's story published on the cover of a nationwide cannabis industry magazine in 2017. And it talks about cannabis for autism. It has a lot of the research citations I've mentioned today, 
attached to that. That was my coming out of the cannabis closet moment as a nurse. I was a holistic nurse before that. So it's really, it's been huge impact and, and I'm glad it's reached a lot of people. And, and I just encourage you to look at this as a serious option for your child with autism. It could be life-changing. It has been for us and so many more. Well, I, I thank you, Jana. And yes. again, if you need to get hold of Jana, you, uh, you want to share your website one more time? Yes, janachampagne.com. And then um, the patient self questionnaire um, and the handbook is on integratedholisticcare.com. So that's another way to reach out if you're right. interested in one of those things. And I'll get John some of the, some of the um, links as well. Like as well. Well, I always share with everyone that, that uh, calls us and, and I refer them up to Jana that you're in, in great hands with Jana and uh, put my reputation on that as well. So I thank you for what you've done for this industry, what you've done for my family, my wife, Corinne, and I over the years and uh, continue to do so. And so uh, I'm excited for what you have coming up in the future and, and proud of you as well. I mean, we've been, like I said, we've been working together for quite some time. So everyone, yes. Janet Campaign, and this is uh, John Malanka with United Patients Group. Be informed, be well, and thanks for being with us. We'll see you soon. Thank Bye -bye. you. Thank you, John.